Cornucopia Radio presents On the 15th of February 1974, Stephen Downing was convicted of the murder of 32-year-old Wendy Sewell. She had been attacked in Bakewell Cemetery in September 1973 and died from her injuries in Chesterfield Royal Hospital two days later. In 2002, Stephen Downing's appeal against his conviction was heard in the Court of Appeal. Mr Justice Pill, one of the three appeal judges, said, On the day of the offence, the officer in charge of the investigation, Divisional Detective Inspector Younger, attended the scene at 2.30pm. He questioned the appellant, who was then taken to the police station. The appellant was not cautioned. He did not have the benefit of legal advice. Eventually, he was cautioned in the late evening. Having been cautioned at 10.45pm, he admitted to Constable Charlesworth, I did do it but I don't know what made me do it. Detective Inspector Younger then was called back into the room. The appellant repeated his admission. He then made a written statement, having been reminded of his caution. He went on to say, In his evidence to the court, the appellant denied the offence. He denied some of the statements to witnesses to which we have referred. He described the interviews which he underwent. He said that he was treated with consideration and provided with tea. He said he had done it when it was not true because he was tired, hungry and his back hurt. He was only just able to keep awake. Detective Inspector Younger put his hand on the appellant's shoulder twice to shake him. He had had trouble with his back for two years after a fall at school. He signed the statement, but it was untrue. He made it because he believed the police would question him all night if necessary and he did not realise that the woman was badly hurt taken from paragraphs 18 and 19 of Court of Appeal Decision, 15th of January, 2002. The following podcast is brought to you by True Crime Investigators UK. But who are they? John was a police officer for 30 years working locally and nationally as a detective. Sally was also a police officer for 12 years and then retrained as a lawyer and practiced in criminal law. Now they are both retired and review cases of interest, some solved, some undetected. Throughout this series they will discuss the cases they are reviewing and interview relevant parties including police officers, suspects, witnesses and experts. They are currently looking into the murder in 1973 of Wendy Sewell in Bakewell Cemetery and the subsequent conviction of local teenager Stephen Downing. Welcome back to True Crime Investigators UK. My name's John. And my name's Sally. John, in the last episode, Stephen met us at the Bakewell Cemetery and guided us around the grounds. He explained what had happened on the day in September 1973 when he found Wendy Sewell lying on the path, having been beaten about the head with a pickaxe handle. Wendy was still alive and she was taken to Chesterfield Royal Hospital. But what happened to Stephen? Stephen Downing was taken to the police station and interviewed during that day. At that time, Wendy Sewell was still alive and in hospital. As a result of the interview, he was charged with the offence of attempted murder and remanded into custody. Wendy subsequently died two days later, having never regained consciousness, and therefore Stephen's charge was amended to one of murder. After being held on remand, he appeared before Nottingham Crown Court for trial between the 13th and 15th of February 1974, after which the jury found him guilty of murder, and he was sentenced by the judge to be held at Her Majesty's pleasure for that offence and for many years nothing was heard of Stephen Downing his parents were trying to make inquiries and gain evidence to prove that he was innocent which he always maintained after his conviction he was innocent until a man called Don Hale who was the editor of the Matlock Mercury came to their help they had meetings with him 
And I think, Sally, I'm right in saying that you actually spoke to him when you were doing your law degree. I did, yes. Um, it's fair to say that uh, Stephen's parents, Ray and Nita, uh, were trying to keep Stephen's case at the forefront and keep it in the public arena and try to get it reviewed. They approached uh, Don Hale, who was the editor of the Matlock Mercury, to see if there was anything that he could do uh, to keep Stephen's case uh, in the newspapers and to public attention. And certainly Don Hale did do a lot of work in relation to Stephen's case. Uh, he took, he reviewed the evidence and he in, interviewed potential witnesses and spent a lot of time and effort in Stephen's case. At that time, in the mid-1990s, which was the early days of Don Hale's involvement, I was doing a dissertation on the vulnerability and suggestibility of vulnerable adults, people detained at the police station and how the vulnerabilities affected them. And obviously, in the course of my research, Stephen's case came up. And as Don was involved, I gave Don a call and asked if I could go and see him and, and talk about the Stephen Downing case. And he was very, very helpful, had a, uh, an afternoon's meeting with him and we went through the detail of Stephen's case. As I say, that was the early days and Don put together a case file which he subsequently submitted to the Criminal Case Review Commission and that ultimately led to Stephen's case being put before the Court of Appeal in 2002. And they subsequently released him, not saying that he was actually innocent of the offence, but it was unsound, the conviction was unsound. Yeah, that's right. He... He was released on bail in December of 2001, pending his appeal, and the appeal was heard in January of 2002. And the decision that uh, the three appeal judges came to was that the conviction uh, was unsafe and therefore his conviction was quashed. And we're going to hear a lot more about Don Hale as our investigations continue. Because he was, there's no doubt, um, I think it's fair to say, without him, probably Stephen Downey wouldn't have been released. And I think probably Stephen would be the first to, uh, first to acknowledge that, yeah. Earlier this morning we were at uh, the cemetery in Bakewell now the weather's turned uh, to rain, so we've come indoors to carry on with our uh, recording with Stephen Downing. Just to recall where we were, you were at the point where the ambulance had taken Wendy Sewell away, the police had arrived, and you were taken to Bakewell Police Station at that stage as yeah. a, a witness, is that right? And, well, they told me it was a witness, but um, right from the word go, I think they suspected me of being the... Uh, person that had attacked her, but uh, I mean, they, they didn't say anything about that. Um, as time went on, I, I, um, I asked for see my parents and a solicitor, and they said, Oh, you don't need anybody, it's uh, you're only here as a witness to answer a few questions. But uh, they kept insisting that I didn't need anybody, and uh, eventually they did say, well, we'll have to call your father and that, um, because we need the clothing you're on and they'll have to bring some down. Um, I believe in the meantime, my father had phoned a, a few times because he'd heard that the police had taken me uh, down to the station. And, uh, and they, again, I believe, kept insisting that didn't need anybody there as, uh, as a witness, didn't suspect anything of that so uh, it was only after about nine hours that uh, they decided to charge me with uh, attempted murder and 
after Wendy had died a couple of days later, they amended it to uh, murder. Just remind ourselves that <clears throat> that time, how old were you? I was 17. And am I right in saying that uh, your reading age was less than that? They, they'd uh, recorded it as being about a le- that's equivalent of an 11 year old. And did you know you were aware of that? You know, from school, slower than other kids? I was the brightest kids? Uh, academically, but I didn't have any uh, exams or qualifications or anything like that. So, um, to me, I didn't need them. I wanted to be a mechanic from the word go. And it's, it's only that uh, there weren't any apprenticeships going at the time. And uh, my uh, grandmother, she, uh, she managed to get me a job with, at a bakery. And then he ended up eventually at the graveyard, which you explained yeah. this morning. Yeah. Yeah. Did you understand what was happening at the police station? Um, not, not to refer, because they, uh, they were just asking questions over and over. It was just complete repetition, and I, and I kept giving, giving them the same answers, which obviously they weren't happy about, but, uh, but I couldn't do anything else on me. And... Uh, <clears throat> Eventually, the, uh, I got so fed up and everything, I was in pain because I, I eventually needed an operation on my spine. And uh, I said, yeah, all right, then I've done it. And uh, right, we'll make a statement. And they, they wrote the statement down and everything. Because at the time, I did know that my spelling was appalling. And I, I, I said, well, you write it down for me then. And then read it back and I, one of them was, uh, you know, I watched her. Oh, so you followed her? I said, no, I didn't follow her. Um, I watched her walk. Yeah, but it's the same thing, you know, you followed her with your eye. But they just put it down as you'd followed her. And were you offered any legal advice or opportunities? Um, not until after I'd been charged, and obviously then my father says, right, we're getting him a solicitor. Mm-hmm. So you fully accept you admitted the... Committing the yeah. offence, yeah. but for the reasons were that you've been there for nine hours. Nine hours plus, yeah. Without um, seeing no. anybody, no friend or solicitor, That's it. etc. And uh, and, uh, um, obviously, I, at the first opportunity, I retracted it. And, uh, but uh, the courts, unfortunately, wanted to believe that the original statement was set in concrete and. I, you know, choose how I tried. I couldn't persuade him differently. So, after you'd be charged with the murder of Wendy mm-hmm. Sewell, obviously you were remanded in prison custody. Was yeah. that Lincoln Prison? Um, I, I was there for a week, yeah. Week? Well, whilst the trial went on, yes. Right. And the trial at Nottingham Crown Court? That's correct, yeah. And that lasted for three days? Three I think? days, yeah. Um, what's your thoughts about what happened at the court? Um, it seemed to be very one-sided, and uh, um, I mean, they, they when they swore the jury, and they says, if you've any objection, state that you know you don't want a particular jury member. And I thought, well, I don't know any of them, so I don't know the backgrounds or anything. So what have I to object to? And it's uh, just unfortunate we did have the wrong people because they took for granted what the more or less than what the prosecution had said, because I didn't have much of a, uh, a defence counsel. I think it was less than a, less than an hour f- for them to find me guilty. Mm. Uh, it seemed to be all cut and dried, really. Did you give evidence yourself to the Crown Court? Um, yeah, I was put in the witness box and questioned and everything. And I, I just went over exactly what I'd done at the police station, uh, other than saying that I'd retracted my admission and gave the reasons why. And what did you think when you were convicted of a murder? I was shocked. I um, couldn't believe it. But, uh, because um, if I'd have taken another day off work, like my mother su- suggested, I wouldn't have been in that situation. Yeah. I mean, now the law, I don't know if you're aware, <laughs> the law's changed mm. to protect people in your position. Yeah. Tremendously since 1973. Mm. Now you would have free legal advice, uh, free if you were having 
difficulty understanding, you get appropriate adults and all sorts of yeah. things, which has been brought in because of these type of cases. That's it, yeah. Um, but at the time, that wasn't was, so. No, no, the, uh, yeah, you had to defend yourself the best you could um, until such times that you got a competent solicitor. And I don't think I did at the time. Um, but to summarise, you were found guilty, obviously, yeah. of the offence of murdering Wendy Sewell. And then you went into the prison system. Yeah. What happened when you first went into prison as a prisoner, so to speak, not a remand person? Well, I didn't know what to expect. And, uh, I mean, after the conviction, I, I was uh, kept at uh, Risley for, I think it was a couple of months, something like that, until uh, a suitable establishment was found. And, uh, and they, they asked me if I'd got any preferences for, and I said, well, no, because I've never been in prison before. Your parents get in touch with Don Hale and he takes your cause up. Mm -hmm. And how does he, he comes to visit you, I understand? Um, I, think he, I think we'd met two, maybe three times. Um, uh, he sent me the, the, the paper every week. Um, and at the time, you, you, we'd spoken a couple of times on the phone because you could buy phone cards, which uh, were two pound each, and they'd, they'd last probably about ten minutes, something like that. He corresponds with you, don't, doesn't he? Um, yeah, only when he needed questions answered or if there was any news to pass on, then, yeah, he'd send me a letter. So from Dom being involved, it still took approximately seven years? About that, yeah. And, uh, I mean, it, uh, people did start believing it a little bit, I think, more when Manid was on board and uh, went to uh, um, appeal that way. And He pursued with your parents and family mm. the cause and eventually it came to a head at the Court of Appeal. Yeah. And what happened there? Um, as I say, I got some terrific lawyers on board. Um, one, one was my QC, he was uh, nephew of uh, Lord Longford. Um, he did a lot of pro bono work, even for me. Um, and uh, if it wasn't for him, I don't think I would have been able to have won the appeal. And what was the main um, evidence that went before the Court of Appeal that hadn't been heard before? Um, the fact that I hadn't been represented by a solicitor or parent or anything like that. And uh, the, the statement was written in pencil and not in biro, but I, I was asked to sign it in biro. Um, and I think they, they were the main ones, really. Wasn't there the... the the police at a certain stage have to give you what they call a caution to say that you don't have to say anything. Uh, was that part of the appeal? Well, it was because they, they'd never given me any caution whatsoever at any point of the proceedings. So, uh, and uh, uh, but, uh, I mean, uh, again, a lot of it was in uh, legal jargon, which I, I didn't understand, but, uh, you know... And it seemed to be going on and on and on. And, uh, and I was sort of daydreaming and all that. And the next thing I knew, uh, the uh, judges, uh, we find him uh, uh, not, not... They didn't go as far as to say not guilty, but um, the, we're quashing the conviction yeah. and uh, free yeah, to go. And I'm thinking, what, what? They were, they were, <laughs> the Court of Appeal doesn't have a jury, does it? It's, was there three judges there? Uh, three judges, Three yeah. judges. And they decide on the evidence put yeah. before them that your conviction wasn't safe. That's it, yeah. Uh, not that you... They couldn't say you weren't guilty, yeah. but it wasn't safe because of the various items yeah. that had been explained to them. So Stephen's conviction was quashed. What were the grounds that the conviction was found to be unsafe? The two main areas the Court of Appeal 
addressed was the admissions made by Stephen at the police station, followed by a forensic scientist who gave evidence in respect of the blood splatter on his clothing. So in relation to the admissions, it's fair to say that Stephen was a vulnerable young man. He got a reading age of an 11-year-old. He'd been held at the police station for, I think, in excess of nine hours. Uh, he got no access to legal advice. Uh, he wasn't allowed to see his parent or any other adult. And it's under those circumstances that he gave his admissions and he admitted that he'd assaulted Wendy with the pickaxe handle. Yes, that's right. At that time, in 1973... There was no safeguards for these people that would protect a vulnerable adult in a police station. And Stephen, as long as, uh, as well as many other people, made admissions because they were pressures. Is probably the wrong word to use, but in a an unfamiliar environment for many hours without any support, which then made vulnerability come in and suggestibility, as you say. And people did make admissions to things that they hadn't done or potentially hadn't done, which was one of the main areas that the Court of Appeal addressed in their judgment. The other is the forensic evidence. At that time, the forensic scientists gave strong evidence supporting a prosecution or the conviction of Stephen because he said it was a textbook case of blood splatter, the clothing having been worn by a person who'd committed the assault on Wendy. That also was looked at. So if we just consider the second ground then, the forensic evidence. So the evidence that Norman Lee, the forensic scientist, gave to the court in the original trial was actually quite damning. He suggested that only the person who assaulted Wendy would have been wearing those clothes. And obviously those clothes were Stephen's clothes. So that was... um, that was really damning to to his case, wasn't it? And then, and that is the area that they reviewed in the court of appeal, and they came to an alternative to that damning indictment that Mister Lee came to. Well, they heard from other forensic scientists who disputed the fact that it was a textbook case, and there was an area of doubt, and therefore, not necessarily Stephen was the murderer but when he went to the scene and saw Wendy he could have received the blood splattering from assisting her as he described it as opposed to being the murderer and that was the grey area that they allowed the appeal on as well as the interview and the confession made at the police station. Yeah so it does make you wonder how Stephen's family coped during the time that he was in he was in prison because he was in prison for 27 years. Yes when he was convicted, his sister Chrissy was only a young girl, wasn't she? Yes, she was 14. 14. So not only have got one son who's 17 years of age in prison for the rest of his life or many, many years to come, they had a 14-year-old to look after. And also, with Bakewell being a very small community, the stigma of the fact that their son or Chrissy's brother had murdered somebody. Yeah, yeah, that's that's right. And... It is a very close-knit community and you can imagine that the stigma that is attached to Stephen being found guilty, not just of murder, but of murdering a local woman as well. Both Stephen's parents are dead now, aren't they? They are. It must have been quite traumatic for them. Oh, indeed, it was uh, a traumatic event that uh, that they've gone through and it just doesn't just end... Once Stephen's convicted, it it lasted for the 27 years that he was still in prison, but there were still ramifications after he was he was released because, as you've talked about, the stigma the the stigma stays, and I think when we're looking at alternatives to who potentially could have assaulted uh, Wendy that resulted in her death, there are still people in. Bakewell locals who still think that Stephen was responsible. And from what information we've uh, found so far, there clearly is a lot of speculation in Bakewell as to who committed the murder. 
be it Stephen, some say other people are responsible. Don Hale's inquiries obviously have uncovered that area that, uh, although there's no conclusions, there's, there's obviously a lot of talk about it in the in the town where Stephen's family lived at that time, isn't there? I think it's fair to say that there's some supposition and uh, as to who attacked Wendy, and I think... Uh, there are people, local people, who still think it was Stephen. There's Don Hale and the like who think that it was a local man known to her. And then there is a former police intelligence officer and an author, uh, Chris Clark, and he believes that it was a serial killer, and a convicted serial killer at that. When we spoke to Stephen, his sister Chrissy was with us all day. It'd be interesting to get her view on what happened and the impact on the family throughout all the years that Stephen was in prison with all the visits they had to make and subsequently up to the Court of Appeal where he was released and obviously what happened after he was released. Hi, Christine. Hello. Do, would you like me to call you Chrissy? I'm more used to being You're called Chrissy. You're more used to being yes. called Chrissy. And we're just going to have a, a little chat today about the immense impact that Stephen being arrested and charged and then convicted of uh, the murder of Wendy Sewell. How old would you be at the time? I was 14 when it happened. And Stephen was 17. That's right, yeah. And have you any more siblings? No, there's just the two of us. And you lived in Bakewell with your mum and dad? That's right, yes. So on the day that Stephen was arrested, where were you? Were you still at school? I was at school. I came home at normal time, around four o'clock. And when I got in home, my mum just briefly told me that Something had gone off in the cemetery that um, somebody had been injured or, and that Steve was helping the police with the inquiries. That, um, you know, he was the one that had found her. So that's as much as we knew at the time. So no cause for alarm at that time? No, not at all. I mean, we just thought, well, um, he's gone back um, to work, found her there contacted the police, so he's the obvious one to help them. Of course. And when did you realise that there was something else going on? I think it was quite later in the evening. Uh, my dad had kept contacting the police and saying, can we see Stephen? Do we need to get him a solicitor? And they just kept saying, oh, no, he's only helping with inquiries... He'll be with you soon. So it was a bit of confusion, really, because the police are telling us one thing, and when you've never had any involvement with the police, you believe what they say. And if they say someone's just helping with inquiries, then you believe it. And are your memories of that that time vivid? Quite vivid, yes. And when Stephen was charged, how did that change them? the face of the family, if you like. I think you're just in total shock because you're not expecting it. You don't know what to do. Um, You've never been in that situation before. And there's nobody there supporting you, explaining what's happening, telling you what the next move is. So you're just sort of in limbo in a way. And... Part of your family's just been torn apart from you. Did you see him at any time before his trial, or were were you not allowed? Yes, we used to go and visit him, um, but the visits were very brief. I think when he was on remand, they were only something... I don't know if they were 15 or 30 minutes or something like that, so you didn't really get a lot of time to, to spend with him. And then when it came to the trial, which was February 
1974. Yeah. Did you go to the trial? We were at the court, but we weren't allowed in because with Steve coming home and speaking to Mum at the lunchtime, she was called as a witness. So that meant that we weren't allowed to go into court either. So, again, we didn't know what was going off. The only time we were allowed in was to hear the verdict. How were you feeling when the verdict was read out? Totally shocked because um, when we left the previous day, um, we'd had journalists from local newspapers ask us to bring photographs the next day because they said, he's bound to get off. He's going to be acquitted. So, of course, that's what we were expecting. And when they came back with the guilty verdict, we were just totally bewildered and gobsmacked. And your mum and dad, how did your mum and dad cope? Um, I don't know. It's not one of them things that we really talked about. I mean, we were there for each other, we supported each other, but it's not something that we, we discussed. We were all just in shock. And how did your mum and dad cope with the time that Stephen was in prison? Fortunately, they were both very strong characters and that helped me as well and I, hopefully it helped Steve. Um, they never lost faith. They never doubted him. So I grew up with that same belief. I mean, there was no way did we ever once think Steve was guilty. You know, it was just a case of being strong for him as well and for each other. And what efforts were made to try and keep Stephen's case and his situation in the public arena? Dad worked quite long hours, but when he wasn't working, he'd got his nose in statements or anything else to do with the case, just going over it and over it in case there was anything that we'd missed. And looking at other options of what could have happened, how things could have occurred. Um, anything that, you know, he could just think of that, that might throw some light on things. And eventually they approached Don Hale who was the editor of the Matlock Mercury? Um, they did, and that was many years later, after we'd received an anonymous letter, somebody saying that um, they were there that day. And I'm not sure if Dad contacted the police about it first and they didn't want to know. So that's when he, he went to see, or rang Don Hale and... Um, he agreed to speak with them. Was that many years after the conviction? Oh, yes, um, maybe 20 years later. And mm. then once Don Hale started to, uh, to look at the matter, was there things that started to happen? Did it get back in the newspapers? Oh, Did, yeah. Was there local interest? Yes, I mean, initially, I don't think... Don thought there was anything to it, till he started reading a bit more about it, the history of what had happened, and then people would start getting in touch with him because he'd printed something in the newspaper about this letter arriving, and then other people would get in touch. and it, There was just sort of so much support all of a sudden that it had brought it back to people's minds and... You know, they they were all very supportive. I think there were quite a few people that didn't want Don to investigate, and I think he had some threats and made him even more determined because he thought if people are threatening him and trying to stop him, then there's something to it. And the campaign that Don Hale spearheaded, that resulted in the matter um, going to the Criminal Cases Review Commission... It did, yes. And subsequently to the Court of Appeal. Yes. Stephen was released on bail pending the appeal. He was, yes. 
And presumably it came home during that time. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Did you go to the Court of Appeal? Yes. Yeah, we were all there. And how did you feel when they quashed his conviction, finding uh, it unsafe? Um, delighted and shocked because we'd had so many occasions where we thought things were going well and then at the last hurdle something went wrong. So we, even though we knew that there was a good chance that it could get the, the conviction quashed, you don't take anything for granted because you're just letting yourself down then. So, you know, it was just sitting there through all this legal jargon that seemed to be going on forever and ever and not really understanding it. Then all of a sudden they just said, conviction quashed. And, you know, I just looked at the people that I was sat with, some people from the BBC, and I'd, is that it? <laughs> you know, you, you sort of expect so much, you know, sort of almost a party atmosphere, and it was just conviction quashed. And that was it. They got up and the judges walked out. <laughs> yeah, and Stephen walked out on that day a free yes. man. And how were your parents once Stephen had been released? They were like new people. I mean, I think there was just such a weight lifted off them because all those years of fighting and trying to, you know, sort of get somebody to listen and then all of a sudden somebody has listened. Unfortunately, Stephen and yourself got to spend some time before your parents passed away. That's right, yes. That's got to, um, that's got to have been a, a relief. It was. It's a shame that they couldn't have had longer together, but I'm just grateful that they did get some time together. It's, it's different for us being on the outside looking in. So how, how do you think that prison life has affected Stephen? Benefited or to his detriment? Probably a mixture of both because if he hadn't been in prison, we don't know what his life would have been. He could have been married, he could have had a family, he could have gone on to have an entirely different career. But on the other hand, he's benefited in a lot of ways because he's learnt skills that he wouldn't have had had he not been there. And I think, in some ways, it's probably made him a stronger person. So, after Stephen's conviction was quashed, what was the police reaction? When the conviction was quashed, obviously the police were left with the uh, dilemma, I suppose, where the person who they believed was the killer, Stephen had spent all those years in prison, and although the Court of Appeal didn't say he was innocent, obviously there was enough doubt to say that his conviction was unsafe. So what they did was review the whole murder inquiry under the title of Operation Noble, which ran for several months reviewing the witnesses, the forensic evidence, and trying to conclude whether any other suspects could be responsible for the murder. And at the present time, this report that they did has not been released in the public domain, so it's very difficult to conclude what their findings were in detail. However, what has been released is that they are not seeking any other suspects and have no other suspects that they wish to interview. And unless further evidence is forthcoming, the case will remain unsolved. After the conclusion of Operation Noble, the question remains, who killed Wendy Sewell? Yes, that's an interesting question. Don Hale gave a number of suspects who he thought may be responsible, linking them to Wendy Sewell, which clearly the police may have looked at and concluded that there, there's no further lines of inquiry, as we've said. However, Chris Clark, more recently, who's an author of crime books, has come up with a, 
an opinion that it may well be a serial killer who was responsible who, with no connections whatsoever with Bakewell. So I think the next person that we need to see is Chris Clark and perhaps include that in our next episode. I should also mention that Stephen Downing has just published a book, the title of which is The Case of Stephen Downing, The Worst Miscarriage of Justice in British History. This book is available on Amazon. Any regrets about being in prison for so long when you could have come out if you'd have admitted the offence? Um, I've got mixed feelings. Yes, I regret it because I had to put my family through so much. Um, well, we could have had probably another ten years together. So has any good come out of being in prison? I've, I've had a free education. Um, I've met people that... Uh, you know, we're good friends there, and one or two st- still good friends. Um, but uh, you know, and uh, so no, I can't regret that far that part of it. And uh, and I'm you know I'm surprised other people don't take advantage that go into prison and you know make better lives for themselves mm-hmm. rather than you know, making it a life of crime, because it never pays. So join us in the next episode of True Crime Investigators UK, when we will be considering who killed Wendy Sewell and reviewing the life and crimes of one of the country's most prolific serial killers. So, there's a question that remains. If you don't believe that Stephen killed Wendy Sewell, then who did? Was it a local man? Someone known to Wendy as others believe? Or was it a different person committing a random or opportunist attack? Consider Peter William Sutcliffe, commonly referred to as the Yorkshire Ripper. He was arrested in January 1981 Convicted after trial on 13 counts of murder, seven attempted murders, and sentenced to life imprisonment. His victims, all lone females, some, but not all, were prostitutes, savagely attacked from behind. His known attacks were committed between 1975 and 1980. But what if his killing spree started before that? His reign of terror being much longer than first thought, What if he was present that day in Bakewell? Join us for the next episode when we'll investigate this further and come to our final conclusions. Thank you for taking the time to listen to the True Crime Investigators UK podcast. This show was researched, produced and presented by John and Sally Midgley. The narrator was Stephen Mawson. It was edited and produced for Cornucopia Radio by Peter Beeston. You can find out more information and case notes about the Wendy Sewell murder by visiting our website at truecrimeinvestigators.co.uk. On the website, you'll also be able to send us messages discover subscription links for all podcast platforms and follow us on all our social media accounts. Make sure you're subscribed to this feed so you can automatically get new regular episodes as soon as we release them. And also, if you enjoyed this series, we'd really appreciate you leaving a review or star rating in your favourite podcast application. Your support will help us grow and expand our true crime investigations even further. Thank you.